you very much for the introduction here. All right, our next one is going to be all about taking this ink capability and building something a lot more powerful in what I think of as the smart cocktail napkin metaphor, like we were saying at the, at the food break. I draw something on the cocktail napkin and hand it to you, you know the work to do. Now I draw it on the cocktail napkin and the computer knows what I drew. So I have a file, some more notes on this one for the 21st century cocktail napkin, which I think about building things in terms of shape grammars, that within a context, a particular shape has some particular meaning. And I don't care about the printer. Let me show you my example of that that I'm obviously proud of because it's the one I wrote, tablet UML. Obviously, if you don't know UML, this won't mean much to you, but here, I draw a circle, an actor appears. I draw an ellipse, a use case appears. And they're appearing over here in this tree as I draw them. I draw a square, a class appears. If I go and say, instead, I want to draw an activity diagram, I draw a circle, an initial state appears. I draw a big ellipse, I get an activity. If I go and draw a triangle, I get a decision point, and so on. So I'm simply taking context, what diagram am I drawing? Shape, what was the syntax the user's providing? Syntax plus context equals meaning. And that's the sort of application we're going to see, take a look at in here. Well, we're going to look at a simpler but also more flexible and extensible version of a shape grammar engine. And so that's why this is about the shape grammar vision. Once again, my bio slide, most important part. And we're not going to look much at slides because this is about the 21st century and slides are so 20th century. <laughs> so instead, we're going to just use the slides as jumping off points to talk about our vision. Which back in the old days had this designer sitting at a table with this customer and they were sitting around that table and they were building something on the cocktail napkin which was a little diagram of some stuff they were building and so on. That was the old days, the old, old, old way of doing things. The new way of doing things is unfortunately still kind of old and also I want a new page. Pardon me while I fight with the tool. Did I get a new page? No, I did not get a new page. Fine. We'll do this the hard way. Give me my new page. Okay, we'll insert a new page the hard way. I wanted to do it with their cool drag and drop approach and it just wasn't working for me. All right, so here's the cool new way. This is so cool, right? Where we have this designer sitting in front of this computer with this mouse clicking and dragging stuff while this customer sits over here on the other side of the computer wondering what that person's doing behind that big screen in that box there. And that's really just kind of getting in the way of the communication that was so easy and obvious up here. Only where'd it go? Down here. So what we really want is something more along the lines of we sit here and do our work in the old-fashioned drawing approach, but the computer understands why. In other words, we want, going back here, the author or the designer or whoever working with the customer, and here's our drawing that's coming out. And as I do this work, I'm drawing in a nice, simple, natural approach, and it's understanding me as you're understanding me. And that's why I titled this particular section the MetaVision, because I use the tools to explain the tools. 
to explain what the benefit is we're trying to see. That sitting there, yeah, I could draw my little UML figures here on a cocktail napkin, but when I drew them in tablet UML, there was meaning behind them. So I was communicating just as much with you, but now I was communicating with the machine as well. So the technology that we're using to build this new vision is, of course, the tablet API itself. But in particular, we're going to rely a lot on the gesture recognizer because that's our syntax made up of shapes that we draw. And then in addition, we're going to rely on something that we didn't see before because it's not a good 60 second demo. We're going to rely on extended properties of a stroke object, which lets you basically attach information to a stroke that's not part of the information that the tablet API knew to collect. It's something you decided to hang on to it afterwards. And so we're going to use the tab uh, extended properties to help us map information back to the stroke objects. Then we're going to, actually in my simplistic example, we're not going to rely on much more, but we could rely on that create strokes, which is what I'm using in tablet UML to do the cleaned up version. But for tonight, because basically I started writing this application at 11.30 last night thinking, hmm, I've got to give this talk in about 19 hours, maybe I better start writing it. I don't have the cleanup work, so I don't go and take the shape that you drew and convert it back to something that's a nice pretty shape. Okay, truth in advertising, I didn't actually start writing at 11.30 last night. Over a week ago I started building the architecture to support this, the general purpose shape grammar engine. So that last night I could go and build the application we're going to see on top of that in well, 19 hours, including the fact that I did sleep in there somewhere. Haven't eaten yet, so I hope there's some pizza left. But I did sleep. The other thing that we're going to rely on, of course, is the mainstay of a lot of modern architecture, which is interfaces. So this shape grammar engine is going to rely on interfaces that it knows how to manipulate, and then particular applications implement them in their particular ways. So let's look at how we built the engine, or built the vision. We started with the shape engine itself. With a couple of interfaces. And I won't remember the names, when we look at the code we'll see that I got them all wrong. But it's something like iRecognizer that says, I'll tell you if I recognize a gesture or not. And I will do that by giving you back an I recognized shape. And if I give you back an I recognized shape, you're done. You don't have to look for somebody else to recognize it because I recognized it. And then underneath that, I had two that I think were I recognized command. And the other one was a word that, as far as I can tell, I've just about got rights to say I coined the term, which is an inkon, an ink icon. It's ink stroke objects that represent some information in the system. So when you get a recognized shape, it will really be either a command or an inkon. And so then a command can be executed, an inkon can be manipulated. Put these two together, and we get code that looks something like this. Let's kill tablet UML here. We don't need it up now. We get code that looks something like this. In my shape recognition engine, we start with the recognized shape interface, which honestly, I haven't found anything to put in it yet. This is demo code. I haven't thought of anything I desperately need in there yet. I've thought of lots of things that could be interesting, but I haven't had a need for them in any of the demos I've got yet, so I haven't put anything in there. All this interface is really doing right now is serving as a base interface for the other two, so I can pass around either one of those and treat it as a recognized shape. The recognized command has got its most important method, 
is execute. And you pass to that two parameters. One is, what's our host? And we're passing it around as an object because I wanted to support both ink pictures and ink collectors. And unfortunately, there is one thing they missed in that wonderful ink picture class. They never gave us a property of, what's your underlying collector? So I wanted to be able to do all this work with, I just give you a collector and you know how to work from there. But instead, I have to give you this host. And anytime we want to know the collector, I have to do what is this a ink picture? Then ask it for the ink object inside. If this is an ink collector, ask it for the ink object inside. But the code for those two is different. So I pass it to host. And I also pass it the shape engine, which is the thing that's running through the recognizers. I also gave it an undo capability, uh, just because I've learned the hard way users expect undo. And it's always easier to design it in from the start than to retrofit it, witness the fact that there's no undo in tablet UML yet. More important, perhaps, is a can I undo this? So we don't even try to undo things that can't be undo, undone. Meanwhile, over in our Incon interface, we really only have got one method, one method that I found that's useful there so far, which is give me the stroke objects that make up this Incon. And because you have to look in an ink object to find them, I had to give it an ink object as a parameter. So now I've got my two basic things. One is something that can be executed. One is something that you can find the stroke objects for it. Looking at my shape engine, now I've got a bunch of fields and stuff to handle the undo stack and the redo stack and so on. I came up with a concept that may have been more complex than we needed for tonight. I came up with an idea of engines that sometimes activate other engines. So in fact, if we go back up and look, we'll see that we've got on our shape engine, a shape engine actually implements I recognize shape. So that the concept I have that I don't have a demo for yet is hey, sometimes what I want to do is activate a new shape engine that when you do a certain gesture, I go off and move into this other mode with its own separate engine. And so I've got some fields that have to do with passing information down the stack because we want the set of incons, for example, to all originate in the base engine of the stack. And we want the commands to all be managed at the base engine of the stack. So I've got some stuff for managing the engine stack. But mostly, OK, here's an example of that host processing. I look and say, if the value is an ink picture, I do this set host with that. If it's an overlay, it's got to be one of those two. Otherwise, the host you've tried to give me is something I can't deal with. Here is probably what I would say is the heart, let me hide these properties, of the engine is a list of I gesture recognizers. And that's what I'm going to walk through when a gesture comes along and say, here's the list. Which one is the first one to recognize it? Oh, first one. How are we going to handle that? How do, I, how do I know the first one is the right one? Well, that's why one of the things I had to have down here is, actually, it's not down here. It's um, in the recognizer, in the recognizer interface. One of the things we have to have in there is an is lower precedence. So I don't just populate the list, you give me one, I put it on the end. I populate the list by you give me one, and I go to the end and say, are you lower precedence than this one? No? OK, try the next one up. Try the next one up. As soon as I hit one where you say, yes, I am lower precedence than that, then I insert you immediately after that one. So in the example we're going to see of an electrician wiring up a building, I had two different things that respond to the square gesture. One is if I'm drawing a room, that's a big square. The other is if I'm drawing a junction box, that's a little square. Well, they're both squares to the gesture recognizer. But part of what you get as part of your response in that gesture event is, and these are the strokes that made it up. And I look and say, well, here's my arbitrary threshold. If it's bigger than this, it's a room. If it's smaller than this, it's a junction box. So therefore. The junction box recognizer had to say, I am lower precedence than a room recognizer because the test for what the size is was in the room recognizer. Hmm? 
Sure. I might in certain environments, I might have that precedent hierarchy rec rep represent a context of, oh, I've come up with these new things that I'm looking for, so they need to be higher up on the precedent scale than these other things or something like that. This, this, that would have to require potentially that I'm not just, not just is lower but also is higher because the new things know about the old one but not vice versa. So I'd have to do a little bit more intelligent insertion into the precedence list. I can do a lot more complex logic than this one. I kept it fairly simple for the purposes of the demo. All right. So there we had our list of recognizers and available as a property as well. Next we have the list of incons that have been added to this drawing so that we can go and walk through those whatever we're going to be able to need to do for our host application. We have a can undo, which basically says if the undo stack is empty, we can undo. We have a can redo, which pretty much says if the redo stack is empty, we can redo. So the undo and redo are actually built into the engine, not the calling application. Some initialization. The parameters that I take on an engine is an array of gesture recognizers. So when I make a new rec new engine, I just say, and here's a bunch of stuff you're putting in. I also had another one, which is I take a host and an array of recognizers. That's actually the one I end up calling most often. Then I've got another version, which takes an ink overlay. I do the dispose management, typical stuff. Bill Wagner can explain it much better than I can. Here, ultimately, is the most important thing. Our gesture recognizer, our gesture event, we respond to it by calling recognize gesture because I like to defer things into worker functions to do the real work. So let's take a look at recognize gesture. Come on, recognize gesture. How far down are you? There it is. This is again having to do with that engine stack. I want to make sure that I go from the top of the stack down to see who recognizes it. Eventually I get to saying yes, I can check it here. And then I walk through the list of gestures, gesture recognizers, and say, hey, do you recognize this? If you do, we're done. And then I say, if I got back nothing, we didn't recognize it. If I did get something back, I can get rid of the whole upper stack. Because let's assume that I had five engines active. And the top one didn't recognize it, and the next one didn't, the next one didn't, and the next one did then probably whatever context we were in up in that upper one is gone. So I need to throw those away and come back to this lower context. If it's an incon, I add it to my incon list. Otherwise, I execute it. And we can take a look at either any of those. And oh, here's the third one is if it's a shape engine, I put it onto the engine stack. The actual execute defers it all the way down to the bottom of the stack. And then it says, OK. I'm going to perform the execute, whatever it happens to be, and then I'm going to put it into the undo stack to say can, this can be undone and so on. So a lot of stuff going on there. Let's take a look at under an example of this now in operation and how I built this. Because I'm just wedded to separating data from presentation, I put the logic for this app in a class library and then I built a presentation layer on top of it, but I simply built a little, really boring game where you move a dog around. I did that through a dog control engine. Inherits from shape engine. And all it does is pass in three recognizers to the engine. Looking at those recognizers, as an example, the movement recognizer says, I'm going to get the gesture that I've got. This get confident gesture just walks until it gets past no gesture, because I'm going to assume I'm not interested in no gesture. And then it says, OK, which one was it? If it's an up, I do an up command. If it's a down, I do a down command, and so on. So I create these command objects, all of which, looking at up command, for example, end up inheriting from move command, at least movement ones do. We've got other ones that do turning. 
and they simply say, here's how I am moving the dog. And we do this by saying I'm going to call to get the dog's height and move the dog that far up or that far down or that far left or that far right. Looking at the turn examples, the turn clockwise command is based on the turn command and says you're going to turn the dog 90 degrees and counterclockwise will be turn the dog negative 90 degrees. And when I put all of these together, I can move my dog around, but I did one more thing, which is I added in undo and redo commands based off the dog command that say I know how to undo, and I do it by telling the engine undo. So this lets me implement two common gestures from the gesture set that this is considered to be the universal gesture for undo and this is considered to be the universal gesture for redo. So putting all of these together, I've glossed over a lot here because I want to get to the other example which I think is even more cool. I've got my dog and let me give myself a little more room to move my dog. I draw a right arrow. The recognizer for move, for, for, the re for the movement recognizer, looks at that and says, I'll make a right command out of that. I'll make another one. I'll make a turn clockwise. Now really, I didn't have to do the move I just did to turn the dog. I could do anything that translated into a clockwise. So I could do this, and it still turns the dog clockwise. I just made it easy that, boy, when that user looks at the dog and wants to turn counterclockwise, I'll bet the user's going to draw that shape. And then the dog can go forward. The dog can also sidestep, because that get height function looks and says, well, I'm going to look at the height at the current orientation. And the dog can go back. And yes, the dog can dance in reverse. And we can redo. So a pretty simple example of the shape grammar engine at work, building commands to move something around. And they all just say, when I execute, I know what to do. The execute is part of the interface. I just have to know how to respond to that. So that gave me a test bed to test the shape engine. From there, I went to a slightly, I only said slightly, more practical application. Questions on this one before we get to the more practical one. So, did your wife like this? She hasn't seen it yet. Oh. Phil knows that we got lots of dogs. Last time I looked, it was five. I haven't been home since Monday. So <laughs> if your animals ever go missing, give me a call. They're at my house. They'll find their way to my house somehow. All right. So that was the simple example. The next one I said, okay, now that I've got this engine which knows how to recognize things and how you can create recognizers and plug them in and create result objects and plug them in, let's build something for electrical work. And again, I put the data into a separate, cla separate class library. And I built the electric engine, which much like we saw with the dog engine, Mostly what it does is it creates a bunch of recognizers and passes them on to the base class. So it creates one for recognizing rooms, one for recognizing conduit, which would be lines, one for recognizing junction boxes, which would be little boxes, one for recognizing outlets, which would be circles, and one for recognizing taps, which aren't shapes, they're commands. And so looking at, for example, the room recognizer, it's now a fairly simple thing. I had to calculate this limit of how big will I let something be before it becomes a room. Arbitrarily, I said anything bigger than one tenth the size of the total drawing surface in either dimension, or anything that's more than one tenth in both dimensions, is a room, not a junction box. And so when I create one, I have to calculate what its room threshold is. When I do the recognize, I get the gesture again and say, hey, if it's a square, maybe it's a room. Now, there is one more method of this gesture recognizer interface that I hadn't touched on yet besides the lower precedence. This one, which is, give me your set of gestures that you recognize. And this one comes back and says, my set is square. 
Whereas the movement one we saw from the dog example, movement recognized right, left, up, and down. So it would come back with an array of four of these. What happens is the shape engine, remember we looked at that set gesture status to enable or disable gestures? What it does is it starts out by saying, turn off all the gestures. And then it just walks through its recognizer collection and says, tell me your gestures. I'll turn those back on. And so each class of recognizer has to, because it's part of this, it supports this interface, has to provide this property, which is an array of gestures it recognizes. And then we come down here and I say, give me the rectangle here in client coordinates. And then I use that renderer that I talked about to convert that into pixels or into ink space. The renderer, besides being able to draw things as bitmaps, although I never got that to work tonight, the renderer also has a method to say, given coordinates in pixel space, what are they in ink space? Given coordinates in ink space, what are they in pixel space? So what I wanted to do was take the size of the window, which is pixel space, convert it to ink space, and make that be the limit size for a junction box, and store that so I don't have to keep recalculating it. So now, I do this get bounding box method. We kind of didn't see get bounding box much. I used it in the, some of the examples in the 60 second demos, but I didn't touch on it much. The get bounding box says, give me the boundary that surrounds either a single stroke or a strokes collection. You've also got some parameters for do I or don't I include like the width of the strokes or do we just count the points that make it up and so on. But basically I'm just saying, give me the box that surrounds this. And then I look and say if it's outside of our limits, I'm not giving you a room. Otherwise, I create a new room object. Room actually inherits from this diagram item type that I created. So that's where the real world is, the real work. Diagram item implements iIncon. And it's going to do that by creating this property GUID and an ID GUID. This is the part that we didn't see in the 60 second demos that I said we were going to see was the key for building this smart cocktail napkin application. We can attach information to a stroke to say remember this besides whatever data you normally contain. Remember I also said that sometimes in rare circumstances COM would peek through the interface. Whatever type you're passing in as the extended data you're attaching has to be compatible with the old COM variant type, which mostly means scalars and strings. You can't just pass around any old object like you can in the .NET world. You're going to have to do everything as strings. So GUID itself can't be stored in it. But a GUID string, a GUID converted to a string can be. But when you store something into a stroke, you want to get it back out. How do you get it back out? You use a GUID as an index. So that's why I had to create two GUIDs here. One is static because I want it to be the same one for every income that we create. That this is the index to find your GUID ID. And then I use that to find the GUID ID as a string, turn it back into a GUID. So as an example here, I'll do a search on that. Searching on that GUID, there we go. When I create a new diagram item, besides this e.cancel, that event that a gesture happens, you notice when I had my little talking example after I drew each shape it would go away? If you set the cancel part of the argument to true, then it keeps the ink on the screen. And then I put a name in and whatnot, but then I go through and walk through all of the stroke objects that were part that event and say here on your extended properties at this ID add this value and then remember that our incons part of the interface had to be give me the stroke objects that make you up well I create a strokes collection that I'm now going to put stroke objects into and I do that by looping over all of the stroke objects in the ink object and making sure it's not deleted I didn't touch on that deleted flag, and I'm hoping that after tonight a bunch of you run out and build tablet applications because I've excited you on this. And if I 
if you do and I don't mention the deleted flag, you're going to curse me. You're going to curse me so bad because you're going to spend hours chasing a bug that won't make any sense until you figure this out. Remember I said that a stroke object can be in multiple strokes collections. The strokes collections are logical collections, not physical collections. Therefore, I could have a stroke object over here in a collection that I then go and say, hey, delete all of the stroke objects in this strokes collection. And that stroke object is still referenced over here. What happens in .NET when something is still referenced, or for that matter in COM, it doesn't get deleted. So it's still there in that collection. So they added this flag on each stroke object to say, has it been deleted? And boy, if that flag is true and you try to do anything with that stroke object, all sorts of stuff is going to blow up. So it's always a good idea when you start dealing with individual stroke objects, before you do anything else, check the deleted flag. And then I try to read the property out. If I can read it out, then I compare it to the one I'm looking for. And if it's there, I add it to the list. I had to do this in a try-catch block. There is no mechanism in this extended properties collection. I love this interface, but this is one of the parts that I say, you didn't quite get it. And the tablet team will shake their heads and say, we know, we're working on it, but it's not there right now. There is no mechanism to say, do you have this ID in your collection? You have to do the try, and it fails, and you catch it, and you say, oh, I guess I didn't get it then. All right. And so that's how I'm getting my stroke objects out. And the room works like that, and the junction box works like that, each one with its different recognizers and so on. Then the other thing I wanted to have was this tap command. And you said, what are we doing with the tap command? We've got this tap recognizer that creates tap commands. What that's going to do is, in its execute method, it's going to call edit incon. And it's going to pop up a form to let you edit what you see. And I'll put all of that together and drop it into a form. And this form app has practically nothing to it. I mean, it's create an engine and attach to two of its events. An event that fires when you get a new incon and an event that fires when you change an incon. And then you do some processing for those. And that's about it. The rest of it's all hidden in that class library. I tell it to go off and run. Give myself some space here. I go and draw a big box. Grr. Try that again. I don't have an erase or anything built into this because, again, I started writing the demo last night at 11.30. Why is it not recognizing that box? Did I break something here? There. Over here popped up room. I go and draw another box, and it pops room again. Well, I don't want two things called room, so I tap that one, and that just created a tap command. And the execute says, pop up this. And I say, oh, yeah, that room is going to be office. And I can come down here and say, this has computers and fridge. Because I'm thinking as an electrician, I don't care about what else is in the room. I care about what power it's going to need. And I tell it OK. And now if I tap on office again, we'll see that information. I come over here, tap on this one. This is the shop. This has machines. Actually, I've got an option here, a checkbox, to turn on and off freehand mode. When that box is checked, it's going to stop recognizing temporarily so I can draw some of those machines. Can I, so I can come over here and I can draw this one and say, this is the hard edge, which is a CNC controlled lathe. And over here is the air compressor. And over here is the drill press. And over here is the fridge. And over here is the computer. So I want to have an idea where stuff's going to be. And I turn recognition back on. I come over here now and I draw a box. And didn't recognize it because I'm just having a miserable day. I draw another box. <laughs> ah, I saw it as a room. All right, but yes, you're right. That's the one I wanted. This one, the junction box. Let me ignore those. I'm going to come over here and draw one fresh. There. So there's our new junction box. 
I tap on this, and it does a pseudo database lookup. Pseudo lookup is really a hard coded list and says, here are all the junction boxes we know about in our system. I say, oh man, I need this one to be a 20 breaker box. Then I want to come down here and say, I want one to be just for the hardinge. I want two to be for the fridge. I want three to be for the drill press. And so on. And now, way down over here in the lower right, it says $52. Because of the stuff I've identified so far, in its database looked up, that's what it's going to cost. I come over here and I add another junction box. And, let me guess, you didn't get that one either. Yep. I'm not having great luck with my gestures tonight. It always works easier when you're at a natural angle. Arg. There, that one worked. I can come up here and tap on that and say I want this one to be a four-way connector. I can draw a conduit between it and the conduit pops up and says here's a list of all the kinds of conduit I recognize. Well, somehow I just got the room. There. I say, yeah, I want this to be 20 gauge copper, which notice it calculated out a length and said this is 13.9 feet. I kind of have an arbitrary scale here. And given the cost of copper, that's going to be 2781. I can come over here and say, well, I want an outlet, and I tap on that outlet and say, this is for the hard edge. It's got a big power need. I need a 220 there. And I add conduit into there. I come over here, add an outlet for the fridge. It puts it over here under office. Well, if I'm going to have conduit over here, I'm going to have to probably have something that gets it there coming from the main breaker box and so on. So I'm drawing shapes just exactly as the electrician would on the notepad. but. Under the hood, I just racked up $312.92. Oh, because of the conduit length, it's priced by the foot. I just racked all of this up as my cost. And when I'm all done drawing this picture, if I'd gone to the trouble of building a print function or an email function, I could send it off to the customer. The inspiration for this is I got a buddy with a machine shop laid out more or less like this and took the electrician over a week to get him a quote. Because he took his yellow legal pad in, drew the stuff in, and then, okay, I guess some electricians are not in the modern world, took it back to his office and started looking stuff up in catalogs. I was like, no, no. If I can understand the picture, the machine should understand the picture. And the machine should be able to pop up all of these options. And what you end up with is, I, I hate to repeat myself, but I'm going to, the smart cocktail napkin. Because it had all of this ease of use if you just draw, and then I tap and, oh, Here's all of this computer behind the picture. I thought I was just drawing a picture. No, here's this database lookup and stuff. Or I can also have the capability to go into, although I haven't built this application, go into my smart cocktail napkin and go and say, change these to be red and be big and so on. So I have all of the ease of use of drawing, but then at a fairly small cognitive leap, I have all the power of the computer. And this is where I see a real benefit here is that small cognitive leap. There's a big leap to go from I have an idea in my head to I drag stuff around on a CAD-like surface and I click stuff and I drag stuff and I do options. Whereas here it's I draw stuff, I draw shapes, I tap stuff, and bingo. I've got information behind the picture. Questions on that? Okay. From there, with this basic capability, I can support all sorts of design applications. I can support a lot more than just this electrician. I just build different recognizers that recognize different shapes and different contexts. I could, were I so inclined to self-punishment, rewrite all of Tablet UML now in terms of here's my recognition engine, here's the recognizers, here's how they respond in this context, and so on. I could then go beyond this. I could certainly start saying that I'm going to respond to more than just gestures. I also get objects, get events for just plain old strokes. 
So as an example, one gesture you won't see in their list anywhere is diagonal. They don't recognize diagonal well at all. The AI under the hood, the neural net, can't tell a diagonal from a horizontal or a vertical, so they've just not tried yet. They've, they've, well, they've not published their tries. They've just decided they can't really tell those apart yet, much as they'd like to. So if I needed to have wires that go at a diagonal, I'm going to have to respond to a different event. I'm going to have to respond to the stroke event instead of just the gesture event. So I'd need to take my recognition system and make it smarter, make it able to recognize more than just gesture events. Uh, potentially, I'd want to respond to users doing things like double taps and such. Oh, I know one other thing that's on here, but I don't have anything I can demonstrate it with because I don't have any selection mode built in here. I forgot to put that in. But one of the things deep in the shape engine is when you are in a selection mode and you select a stroke, it looks and says, is that stroke part of an incon? So it walks through the list of incons and says, oh, yeah, it's part of that. I don't think you meant to select part of an incon. So it changes the selection to be the whole incon. Or if you selected a bunch of strokes that made up multiple incons, they all get selected at once. So it ends up with a simple way to tap on one stroke and you get the whole shape because they're all tied together because they've all got this common extended property under the hood. All right, questions on this one? Questions on tablets in general, because right now this is a little bit, I know of, of, well, a little bit, a lot of code thrown at you, but you can sort of see this underlying architecture of an engine with recognizers plugged in, creating objects and commands. And all of a sudden now it just becomes a matter of what are your objects, what are your commands in your context. All right, no more questions? So what is a, a real world application beside this one that you're talking about? I think almost any sort of a design environment where you would draw pictures to communicate. Landscaping. Um, mm -hmm. I could honestly imagine, although I'm no chemist, but I know chemistry has got its very well-defined notation. I could imagine using this to create chemical symbols and equations at a board and having it calculate out atomic weights and whatnot. I don't know if I'd want to use it in a production chemistry environment, but a teaching chemistry environment I could imagine would be pretty useful. You'd, you'd want to be better at it than this simple example. You'd That's put more right. work into it. You would just add the way you're, you're, you're doing it, the title to them, which once, once an object is defined, you would just transform it into a, a nicer looking mm -hmm. um, version, and then you're, you're good to yeah. go. So for me, this sort of puts the power of computing in the hands of people who think in design as opposed to people who think more in terms of text and data entry. And so I can imagine a lot of business cases along that way. Um, one thing I didn't get into here is maybe I want to do something else where I tap this and I can just speak notes. Well, the tablet's got that capability, but it was far more than I was going to get done for this demo tonight. But to me, I can see that that adds yet more power for their users. I draw stuff, I draw stuff, I draw stuff, and I tap something and I say, this is what I'm doing. Or what I think is probably even more useful than the tap might be a press and hold that when I press, the microphone activates, and it's recording everything I say and transcribing it into text until I let go. I can see that. I haven't decided if that's the right approach or not, because I can see a lot of other things you might want to do with press and hold. But I can see that as being one real good way of annotating things. I draw, I draw, I draw. Oh, press. Yeah, this is the plug for the hard hinge. Make sure it's got extra ground protection, because that thing sometimes has real kickback or something like that. Yeah. yeah. How new is this API and uh, other commercial applications that you The one I, I'm showing off here, the shape engine, or the tablet API in general? The tablet API in general. Uh, it's commercial use goes back um, late 2002. So there's a lot of commercial uses of it, but it's not nearly as widespread as I think it ought to be, which is part of why I'm on this, this big crusade to make more people aware of how easy it is to use. Microsoft in January at the mobile partners briefing was saying a million tablet PCs deployed out to the field, and they're expecting close to a million to deploy this year. That's not as much as they'd like. You know, if I had a million of anything deployed, I'd be pretty happy. 
they'd like to see bigger numbers than that. But those numbers mean there's a pretty large base out there if you can find what that base needs. When we look now at the origami, I'm sorry, ultra mobile PC, UMPC, I'm still going to call it origami because I think Microsoft for once had a cool name and then when they finally hit the streets with it, they defaulted to a marketing name. These origamis, which are basically small handheld tablets, they are full-blown Windows machines with a tablet operating system, I think that's going to start opening up a lot more people who will be able to do sort of small design things with their little handheld device, and so it's going to open up more opportunities here. Now, do I have people ringing my phone off the hook with, we need tablet apps written? No. But there's a lot of them out there. Mostly right now they're in vertical markets. And what I'm trying to point out is, well, maybe we need to open up a lot more vertical markets that this capability allows, but we haven't had the right people knowing how to do this combined with the knowledge of what their domain is. I got lucky with Tablet UML. I've been teaching UML since 97. I was my own best customer for figuring out what this thing should do because I've been using UML tools for that long. So I could take the real low-hanging fruit for me of make it do what I need a tool to do. If I were instead dealing with a chemist, I'd have to have them teach me chemistry or I'd happen to already know chemistry and I learn the tablet stuff. So that's what I'm hoping to do is inspire some of you to say, I know a domain that could use this and I know how to write that code. Other questions? I have a question. Sure. I haven't been asked it. To my knowledge, there's nothing that's really even close yet, although some of the 3D-ish stuff in Vista has got ink support on it, but you're still really working in a 2D world. I've seen some stuff that Microsoft Research is playing around with. To me, I don't know that I see anything practical there yet. All right, other questions? Have you actually seen an origami? I have not got to see an origami yet, other than at the partner's briefing where I got to look at it for 30 seconds and pass it to the next person. So I didn't, to me that's not seeing. Seeing is I want to play with it and walk around with it for some time and so on. They're very hard to find right now. They're high demand. Sort of like when I bought my first tablet, I ordered it on January 2nd and received it on March 10th because everybody like me wanted to get one right away. That's kind of where the origamis are today. <laughs> Um, oh, now I'm forgetting who was the first one out. Um, I keep wanting to think Samsung um, had theirs released about a month ago, and before it even hit the street, the whole order was already sold. So, and I think somebody else just announced that theirs is coming out or is hitting the street soon. I'm not expecting I'll get to see one for real use yet for another month. All right, other questions? All right, yeah. What sort of specs would you use in a tablet PC that you use for the Lightning? What sort of specs would you need on a tablet PC that's used for development? I kind of measure that in dollars as opposed to specs. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the best you can get your hands on is going to run somewhere close to 3000 uh, but you don't have to have a tablet PC to develop tablet PC apps. I prefer to because I'm on the road a lot. I need to have my development platform be mobile. But you can develop tablet apps on a machine that has the tablet SDK installed, which does not have to be a tablet PC. Now, you're going to have to have the tablet OS to test it on. Although some of it you don't have to. You can just have the SDK. But the recognizers for gestures and text are only available on the tablet PC edition of Windows XP. And so if you're going to do any gesture work, any text work, you're going to have to test that on a machine with tablet XP, which you can get through MSDN if you're a subscriber, which I assume most of the people here are. That shows up as part of your premium subscription. So you can test on a non-tablet with that. You, if you want the pen functionality, you can plug in a Wacom digitizer or any other HID compatible digitizer, and you can get the pen functionality there. So you don't have to commit to buying tablets to develop tablet software. I prefer to, 
But I understand that for a lot of people, they want all the development power they can get, and tablets aren't there where they want them. So, so you're saying that If you've got the tablet OS installed, it has it. You can install the tablet OS on a regular PC mm -hmm. and then use the digitizer on the side. Yep. And the other thing to point out, in Vista there will be no longer a tablet version of the OS. Okay. In Vista, all versions of Vista will have the tablet stuff already installed. So you won't have to install a new operating system for tablet development there. As the tablet team likes to say, in Vista, all machines are tablet PCs. Some of them just don't have the hardware installed. <laughs> well, they got a little bit of flack that some of the, I don't know why. I mean, you can tell I love tablet PCs. And in fact, here's under the hood. My real, get rid of the secret identity, my real identity is a tablet geek. This is my orange, does your code think in ink t-shirt? You can't get the orange ones anymore. They're long since gone. This is the real me, and the real me does not understand why there are people out there who not only are skeptical about tablets, but seem to want to watch them fail and root for them to fail. And when the word came out that there would not be a tablet PC edition of Vista, those people, unfortunately for some reason, eWeek seems to be full of them, were just out there crowing, the tablet is finally dead. We've been telling you for years the tablet was dead. It's finally dead because there's no tablet PC edition of the OS. And this is why the team has this response back of, they're all tablets now. <laughs> Just some don't have the hardware. Because they were slammed about this, you don't have a tablet version anymore. And they do. And that, in fact, will open up the capability. Recently, I think it was uh, MIT, some media research lab had a video up on YouTube of a great big touch desktop with an overhead projector running a Windows display onto this touch desktop. I'm thinking, with Vista, that's a tablet PC. I can have a drawing surface the size of my desktop to do my designs on with my team around it and looking and critiquing the design and so on. A touch size, a desktop size tablet. Assuming that ever hits market, which you know it will eventually, if it's running Vista, it will be a tablet PC. And I can't wait to see my application running on that and think, Boy, this is now my ultimate design surface. All right, well, it looks like I need to be turning control back to the officers here. I do thank you for your time and attention. I hope that I've made you at least a little bit as excited as I am about this tonight. Thank you.